So these are the top 10 errors that students made last year in their physics exams. Now, although this is written for OCR and specification A, these are the kind of mistakes that all students make for every single physics exam board. Now, I've got a more of a generic video, which you can find linked to up here, which is talking about the things that you need to improve uh, just in your general exam technique. But this video is going to look at some of the key mistakes that you should not repeat. People made these mistakes last year. Learn from that, and that means it might only be one or two or three more marks that you gain per question, but this could be the difference between the A grade and an A star, perhaps. So these are the things that you really need to tighten up on and just pay attention to. So number one, when you're answering a question about practical skills and maybe how you do in a practical experiment, people say things like make sure that you measure the time or measure the amount of substance. That's rubbish, OK? You need to be very specific and spell it out. I know it's obvious, but say that you're going to use a stopwatch to measure the time. Don't use the word amount, use the words volume and maybe talk about using a measuring cylinder. So although it's obvious that you're going to use a, um, a thermometer to measure temperature, make sure you actually spell it out in the question the actual equipment you're going to be using for making measurements. Number two, make sure that you get your names of forces correct. We use things like upthrust. We don't use the term buoyancy. We use the term weight, not gravity. Never, ever put gravity as a downward force. OK, weight is the thing that we need to think about. Simple marks, you know, maybe this is only, uh, if you've got something like this, you might lose one mark. But it's these little marks here and there on the easy kind of bits of recall that you need to get completely right. So make sure that you look at your list of forces and make sure that you then label your free body diagrams appropriately. A bit of quantum stuff now. These two spectra are very similar, but you've got to remember which one is an emission spectra and which is absorption. So looking at these two things here, can you tell which is which? If you can, that's good. If you can't, go and have a look in your textbooks now, look at some of my videos, and just make sure that you don't get the emission or absorption spectra mixed up. Number four, and a simple one, this is just about remembering which has the shortest or longest wavelength. Now, maybe a, may a way to remember this is if things are redshifted, the wavelength gets longer. Uh, and so this is correct, that red light has a longer wavelength than blue light, which has a shorter wavelength. And you might think about that in terms of uh, how, how much energy things have. Uh, red is next to infrared, which is fairly low energy. Violet is next to ultraviolet at that end of the spectrum where you've got a shorter wavelength, higher frequency and therefore more energetic wave. Simple recall, just make sure you get it right. And number five, the photoelectric effect. Um, you've got to remember what the word intensity means, okay? Basically, um, the intensity of the wave or whatever it might be is basically, um, in terms of the photoelectric effect, the rate of emission of electrons. If you double the intensity, you double the number of electrons which are being given off Per second. Number six is a fairly common misconception. If you've got an alternating current in maybe the primary coil over here, what this does is it induces an alternating magnetic field in the core. And then that then induces a, an alternating current, or after you, it induces an EMF, in the secondary coil. So effectively you've got current over here, you've got current over here, but you do not get an electric current in the core. That's why you have this laminated core made up of different layers, and it's really only the magnetic field which is alternating inside the core. So make sure that that's very clear and explicit in your answer. And this one here, number seven, pretty straightforward. Get your electrical circuit symbols completely sorted out. LEDs, LDR, okay, they both got an acronym of three letters, but make sure you know what is what, okay? This thing here, and you can sometimes have a circle around it as well, is a light-dependent resistor. An LED, well, okay, this is a diode, this symbol here, but an LED should have the lines going away, showing that's the way that the, the light is being emitted. So basic thing, get your circuit symbols correct. Again, this isn't any more difficult than GCSE, but just make sure that you are 100% sure about what they all mean. Number eight, and a little bit about centripetal force. Now, um, it's basically not a real force. Centripetal force is the result of other things that allow something to move in a circular path. So, for example, if you've got a conical pendulum and you've got a string here, the actual centripetal force is not really there, but in this case it's the resultant of the horizontal component of tension in that string. And that thing there acting inwards is what causes that centripetal force. So um, just make sure that uh, you're very clear about this when you answer questions.
Number nine, and again, this relates to the way that you describe experiments, okay? Um, and we know this, I know that my year seven classes know this. Um, when you're describing an experiment, you don't just take a single measurement, you take repeated readings so you can work out an average and identify any anomalies. Again, make sure that you state that when you're writing stuff, and that gets you just that one little extra mark that might be the difference between that grade that you're after and the one that you're kind of just missing out on. Uh, and finally, number 10, uh, this one here, I must say, um, I didn't, haven't really sort of taught this explicitly, okay? Now, um, redshift. Um, emission lines all undergo the same fractional wavelength increase, uh, and larger wavelengths have a larger absolute increase. Quite specific, but maybe it could be quite important. What does that mean? Well, um, and I've got a video up here about the Doppler effect. Um, the Doppler effect is effectively the change in wavelength over the original. And what that means is that if you start at something with a short wavelength, um, the wavelength gets a little bit longer. But because you've got the same percentage change, as you have a longer wavelength, it's going to increase by an even larger amount. Very, very specific. But this is the kind of physics that, you know, gets uh, some of you these top grades. So um, have a look at that one there. Try and sort of work out what that means. It doesn't mean that every single wavelength gets shifted by the same amount, but ones which are longer get shifted by uh, an even greater wavelength. So there we go, those are my sort of top 10 kind of key mistakes that you can't make this year. You've got no excuse, okay? And if you're not sure, go and have a look at some of my videos, have a look in your textbook, and maybe see where these are relevant in other questions. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, hopefully they're the little mistakes that can just gain you those few extra marks to make you do even better in your exams this summer. Again, although this is um, OCR specific and maybe specific for physics A, these are the kind of mistakes that uh, people make um, across all different exam boards for physics. So just make sure you're aware of that and pay attention to the little details. If you pay attention to the little details, one or two marks per question, that's the thing that after a while it does add up to many, many more percent in your final exams. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much and good luck.